Welcome to the Acute Heart Failure Protocol Module. Before we start, I'll give some background on heart failure and the importance of this protocol. Acute heart failure leads to over 1 million admissions to the emergency department in the U.S., and each year the hospitalization costs total $20 billion. 90% of these patients get admitted and most are treated with the routine treatment. Of the patients that present with heart failure to the emergency department, more than 50% qualify to be discharged. The diagram below shows the phenotypes that can be seen with acute heart failure, which can often go unrecognized. Some of the phenotypes we will discuss during this module include pulmonary edema and right heart failure, as well as other more specific phenotypes not shown in this diagram but will be discussed later. To satisfy the objectives listed below, we propose a protocol that can be used to rapidly identify the acute heart failure phenotype that includes focused echo, lung, and IVC ultrasound. This protocol can be used to tailor therapy to the acute heart failure phenotype as well as monitor improvement. Our hope is that if there is significant improvement after treatment is initialized in the emergency department, that clinicians may use the findings to consider discharge from the emergency department or observation unit. For the assessment of systolic function, we want to be in the parasternal long axis view. To obtain this view, place the phased array probe on the left border of the sternum and intercostal space 3 or 4 as seen in the video here. The marker on the probe should be pointing towards the patient's left elbow. This is an example of a heart with good systolic function. In this view, we can appreciate the left ventricle seen here, the left atrium seen over here, the anterior leaflets of the mitral valve here, the aortic outflow here, and the right ventricle on this side, as well as the septal wall and the inferior walls of the ventricle. Also, we can tell that this heart has good systolic function because the myocardium of both the septal and inferior walls of the ventricle are contracting strongly as well as the mitral valve leaflets hitting the ventricular walls. Here is an example of good versus poor systolic function. The image on the left is of good systolic function while the image on the right is of poor systolic function. We can tell it is poor because the mitral valve leaflets are not hitting the ventricular walls and the ventricular walls are not contracting strongly. When looking at systolic function, we want to do it globally, meaning that we want to make sure that we look at all the important structures, such as the mitral valve, the septal and inferior wall contractility, as well as the left ventricle chamber size change during the cardiac cycle. The reason this is important is because if those structures are damaged, then they can't be used for visually assessing systolic function. For example, if a patient has mitral stenosis, then the leaflets of the valve might not hit the ventricular wall. Another example would be a patient with a previous MI. They could have focal damage to the myocardium, producing weak contractility in that left ventricle region. Both of these instances could be interpreted as poor systolic function, but this would be a false positive. Lastly, even though the systolic function can appear normal, the patient can still have acute heart failure. 50% of patients that have acute heart failure have normal systolic function. These patients are classified as having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We will discuss identifying this phenotype later. Now let's move to beelines. To assess for the presence of beelines in the lung, we need to use the phased array probe pictured here on the top right corner and place the probe at the midclavicular line around the second or third intercostal space with the probe indicator pointing at the patient's head. Examine the whole anterior chest wall from both lung APCs sliding towards the base. In a patient with dry lungs, you will see A-lines only, which can be seen here, as well as the pleural line and some rib shadowing. The image on the left is showing what A-lines would look like on ultrasound of the lung. Here you can see the A-lines, the pleural line, and some rib shadowing. A-lines are simply reverberations of the pleura that are seen in dry lungs. However, patients with isolated right-sided heart failure can present with A-lines as they usually do not have pulmonary edema. Instead, they have systemic congestion as seen with a plump or plethoric IVC. The image on the right is showing B-lines, which you can see here extending from the, from the pleural line all the way off of the screen. 
The presence of beelines indicates that the lungs are wet, which means that edema is present in the interstitium. Beelines also indicate an increase in the density of the alveoli of the lungs. The edema is not specific for heart failure as it can be caused by many things such as inflammation, infection, or fluid in the lungs. The more beelines seen, the more edema is present, which means there is increased pressure in the capillaries. Some of the pitfalls of using beelines for acute heart failure are that they are not specific. This means that if you see beelines, it doesn't automatically mean it is acute heart failure. It could be pneumonia as it presents with beelines as well, either unilaterally or bilaterally. It could also be respiratory distress syndrome as this also presents with beelines but in a patchy distribution. However, in a patient with a history of CHF and presentation that is suggestive of acute heart failure, beelines seen in bilateral anterior zones has a sensitivity and specificity for acute heart failure of 85%, which is much higher than the chest x-ray. To visualize the IVC, we want to use a subcipher view by placing the phase array probe on the right upper quadrant with the probe marker pointing towards the patient's head. Once the IVC can be seen, you'll want to look for landmarks to verify and help you identify the IVC. The best landmark to use is the hepatic vein inlet draining into the IVC as it helps to differentiate from the aorta. You can also identify the right atrium seen here. IVC respirophasic diameter change is well validated for assessment of right atrial pressures. It is a standard part of an echocardiogram. This is an alternative view of the IVC. Sometimes a subcipher viewing window might be unobtainable in some patients. If this occurs, you can use a right subcostal view to see the IVC. You use the phased array probe and place it on the area of the liver at the mid axillary line with the probe marker pointing towards the patient's head. Here you should be able to see the IVC as well as the liver and hepatic veins. The right atrium might not be visible, however. Here you can see clearly the IVC. The image on the left is of a normal or collapsed IVC. It is less than 2 cm in diameter and has greater than 50% change with respiration. The image on the right, however, is a plethoric IVC, which means that the IVC is greater than 2 cm in diameter and has less than a 50% change with respiratory variation. The IVC becomes plethoric when the right atrial pressure increases above 10 mm of mercury. Remember that for isolated right heart failure, a dilated IVC may be the only finding as these patients will not have pulmonary edema or abnormal left ventricular systolic function. However, if both pulmonary edema and a plump IVC are present, consider acute heart failure with preserved left ventricular function or ejection fraction. There are four acute heart failure phenotypes that we want to cover in this module. The first one is poor systolic function. Patients that present with this phenotype are at risk of cardiogenic shock, on ultrasound, you would observe a plethoric IVC, beelines, and poor left ventricular function. Another phenotype is flash pulmonary edema. This presents with beelines and a plethoric IVC. However, you can observe a normal or minor reduction in systolic function. These patients have an acute presentation and have a redistribution problem. The next phenotype is isolated diastolic dysfunction, which is seen more commonly in elderly patients. The presentation consists of a plethoric IVC and normal systolic function with the addition of pulmonary edema. Lastly, isolated right heart failure has a similar presentation to isolated diastolic dysfunction, but the pulmonary edema is absent. Now, how do we assess the severity of acute heart failure? One of the best ways to quantify the severity is to look at the degree of pressure overload of the left heart. In this case, we need to look at both the velocity of blood flow and diastology, but in the left ventricular relaxation phase, as well as during atrial contraction. We also need to see how well the left ventricle myocardium is moving during these phases. To do this, obtain apical four chamber view on ultrasound, then press the Doppler button. On the new menu, press PW and place the indicator on the center of the anterior leaflets of the mitral valve as seen in the image to the right and press start. You will see an image similar to the one on the left. The E-wave gives you the velocities of blood flowing into the left ventricle during left ventricular relaxation, while the A-wave gives you velocities flowing as a result of atrial contraction. 
Sometimes you won't see a clear A wave due to atrial fibrillation, tachycardia, or very severe presentations of acute heart failure. However, the E wave you will always see. To measure the motion of the left ventricle myocardium during diastology, we will use something called tissue Doppler imaging. It basically is pulse wave Doppler, but optimized for viewing the myocardial motion. In the apical four chamber window, press Doppler and then select TDI. Place the indicator on the septal annulus and press start. You will then see an image on the screen that is similar to the one shown here on the left. After this is done, you want to do the TDI on the lateral annulus as well, which is shown on the image to the right. Once both measurements are obtained, they can be used along the pulse wave Doppler to assess the different grades of diastolic dysfunction. An E divided by the average E prime plus four is a good estimation of left atrial pressure. There are three grades of diastolic dysfunction. But first, we will start with normal diastolic function in the heart and the tracings that would be seen for pulse wave Doppler and tissue Doppler imaging. These are going to be our measurements for comparison to the diastolic grades 1 through 3. The E and E prime waves represent filling associated with left ventricular relaxation, while the A and A prime waves represent filling associated with atrial contraction. The first column here will be the normal measurements for PWD and TDI. Grade 1 diastolic dysfunction is also known as impair relaxation, which occurs because there is abnormal relaxation of the left ventricle. The atrial contraction compensates, hence the increased velocity of the A and A prime waves. The left atrial pressure is normal in impair relaxation, and so patients should not have signs of acute heart failure. Over time, there is progressive pressure buildup of both the left ventricle and left atrium. This elevated left atrial pressure leads to a rapid left ventricle filling during the early part of diastole, which is entirely passive. Compare this to normal left ventricular filling in early diastole, which is due to left ventricular relaxation. Think of normal filling as a suction effect and the left ventricle as a syringe pulling in blood in early diastole. In diastolic dysfunction with elevated left atrial pressures, blood is pushed into the left ventricle from the left atrium as a result of the excessive left atrial pressure. Of note, it is this elevated left atrial pressure that causes pulmonary congestion and subsequently systemic or peripheral congestion. Grade 2 diastolic dysfunction is also referred to as pseudonormal because the E and A waves on PW Doppler look very similar. However, this is when we can use TDI to see the difference. Here you can observe that the E prime wave is abnormally low, less than 7 or 9 centimeters per second depending if the septal or lateral annulus is being assessed. The most severe form of diastolic dysfunction, type 3 or restrictive filling, is when the left atrial pressure is so high that blood rushes into the left ventricle when the mitral valve opens. Therefore, the E wave is typically two and a half to three times the A wave. Sometimes the A wave isn't even seen. However, the E prime or actual motion of the myocardium on TDI is abnormally low. Unlike systolic function, which typically does not change in acute heart failure, diastolic function does change in real time. If you give a preload reducer and or diuretics, you can expect the diastolic function to improve. This is why diastolic assessment is so powerful in estimating the severity of acute heart failure as well as response to therapy. In summary, application of this protocol can help identify the phenotypes of acute heart failure and start a specific treatment for that phenotype. It can also be used for reassessing a patient after initiating treatment and finally to see if a patient qualifies to be discharged from the emergency department. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Basaure and Dr. Chiem. Also, please email Dr. Chim for any questions regarding the protocol and be on the lookout for a video with cases using this protocol. Thank you.